all right guys this is a normal artery and this is an atherosclerosed artery and now that you've seen how atherosclerosis actually looks like how about i teach you how this goes from this and this leads to this so for this lecture i would be referring to the book robins and according to the book they first teach you about the risk factors of atherosclerosis but i'm going to take the hatke way and actually teach you the pathogenesis first pathogenesis is how it takes place and according to the pathogenesis i'll tell you why each thing is a risk factor so atherosclerosis according to the name of course it's some greek or latin you can figure out that it means hardening of the vessels people usually describe atherosclerosis as the healing response to an endothelial injury so let me elaborate this sentence to you endothelium this is an artery it has an external adventitia layer which has all vessels and nerves along the artery it has a muscular middle layer which is usually very thick followed by a single celled endothelium which separates it from the muscular layer and the lumen and this is the lumen of the artery so whenever there's an endothelial injury the first response is of platelet aggregation and healing healing because this is an injury and now healing is usually the task of various immune cells and when immune cells are involved this is called an inflammatory response and inflammation usually leads to the formation of an atheroma so let me show you how it looks in a gross manner after which i'll touch upon the cellular aspects of it so this is a normal arterial wall the media layer the endothelium yeah now suppose due to some reason there is an injury to the endothelium that leads to facilitation of platelet aggregation and thrombus formation because you need to prevent bleeding so in that scenario there is vasodilation the space between each endothelial cell increases that leads to increased permeability of this particular vessel yo someone's really shouting outside my hostel room so you have platelets here and since platelets are accumulating here and as i told you immune cells are also involved you have monocytes if you do not know them already they are basically wbcs white blood cells which are immune cells and other leukocytes accumulating here which through the increased permeable space also enter the space between the media which is this and the endothelium and they start accumulating here now another thing that we must know is in case of any abnormal lipid state in the body there will be accumulation of oxidized lipids so when this event happens those lipids usually enter along with the monocytes and now since there excessive abnormal lipids these monocytes and macrophages usually engulf these lipids so these are filled with lipids and since these are filled with lipids let's draw a few platelets here they become activated so these macrophages are activated and they release several factors known as cytokines growth enhancers etc now cytokines are one of the most important mediators of inflammation when cytokines are released this causes more cells like t cells excessive monocytes and other macrophages to also accumulate near this artery and enter via the endothelium these activated platelets and macrophages also release factors that recruit smooth muscle cells and extracellular matrix now smooth muscle cells as you know are present in the tunica media so these cells are recruited and ecm extracellular matrix includes fibrin collagen and other connective tissue all of this together leads to the artery which was like this before becomes something like this with the entire atheroma here now this is how it looks in a gross picture let me talk about all the cellular events that are taking place to lead to this firstly let's talk about how hyper 
cholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia starts this entire process. So lipids, for example, low density lipoprotein, high density lipoprotein, cholesterol, which is usually in the form of low density lipoprotein, etc. All these factors have certain abnormalities in their levels in the body. For example, when LDL levels increase, it leads to atherosclerosis. But HDL is atherosclerotic protectant. That is, so there can be a lot of factors, genetic factors, etc. Or even dietary factors why LDL increases in the body. Now, when LDL increases in the body, two things can happen. One is impaired endothelial function or the second being formation of oxidized LDL. The first one is mediated by increased formation of free radicals by LDL molecules, by freely flowing LDL molecules in the blood which are in a higher quantity. And these free radicals usually impair endothelial function by decreasing nitric oxide and nitric oxide is essential for vasodilation that is opening up of the arteries. So as you can say, according to the name, this is vasodilation and this is vasoconstriction. Secondly, oxidized LDL. So when there is excess of LDL in the bloodstream, it usually accumulates around the intima or the endothelial layer of the cells. So as you know, this is the endothelium, this is the tunica intima, and this is the muscle layer or tunica media. So usually these lipid molecules accumulate in the intima throughout the artery, right? Now let's see how this turns into an atheroma. So as you know, endothelial injury that might be caused by turbulent flowing blood. For example, if these are two arteries and this one artery is diverging into two arteries, this area is more likely to have an atheroma here because the blood flows in a turbulent manner here which can cause endothelial injury. And as we saw, when endothelial injury happens, inflammatory cells are recruited. These inflammatory cells release what you know as free radicals. Free radicals are reactive oxygen species with one free electron. Now, these free radicals react with normal LDL molecules and form oxidized LDL. And this is a chain reaction. Free radicals always cause chain reactions of multiple free radicals being formed until there's a terminating fact. Or partially oxidized LDL cannot really be metabolized. So it remains in its weird form. And this weird form cannot be degraded by any cell. So it's just taken up by macrophages. And these lipid-laden cells that we saw before are known as foam cells. Now, after all of this has happened and foam cells have formed, platelets have accumulated. I told you that an inflammatory reaction starts. These foam cells are basically activated macrophages. Activated macrophages always release pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, which is by the way also pro-inflammatory. And all of these together recruit increased number of T cells, macrophages and monocytes which come and accumulate near the artery. And now these increased number of T cells and macrophages, not only do they increase the inflammatory response, but they also secrete other cytokines and free radicals which basically form a cycle of this process where these free radicals again oxidize LDL Again, this entire thing becomes repetitive but scary cycle. And as I also told you, most of these platelets and T-cells and macrophages end up releasing platelet-derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor. And these factors together recruit smooth muscle cells from the tunica media and extracellular matrix as I explained before. These smooth muscle cells also get lipid laden and in totality a proper atheroma is formed. Let's see the components of this atheroma just for us to revise once more. So at the top or the head of this atheroma is formed by calcified fibrous 
extracellular matrix composed of fibrins and collagens etc along with smooth muscle cells and below that you have t lymphocytes lipid laden macrophages lipid laden smooth cells etc and in the middle a necrosed center necrosed means dead so you have all the lipid debris the cellular debris from the inflammatory process etc right in the middle and this is how a typical atheroma would look like now that we know about all of this let's see the risk factors for atherosclerosis and how this can cause heart attack so there are two kinds of risk factors modifiable and non-modifiable so non-modifiable you have genetics genetics includes a genetic predisposition for hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia age as age increases you have a lot of factors like chip which are expressed in our cells which make it easy for cells to proliferate or inflammatory process to happen to which leads to atherosclerosis and then you have gender so we see that the male gender is more susceptible to atherosclerosis and also postmenopausal women and this is because estrogen in women is usually an atheroprotectant which is basically because it causes vasodilation it causes smooth muscle relaxation nitric oxide production etc and now let's talk about the modifiable ones yeah so you have hyperlipidemia an unhealthy lifestyle or dietary causes etc after which you have hypertension which can increase your risk for atherosclerosis by about 60% and then you have cigarette smoking so cigarette smoking usually causes endothelial and vascular smooth muscle cell injury which again you know increases your chances of getting atherosclerosis by bumps and finally you have diabetes mellitus so diabetes mein kya hota hai the chronic hyperglycemia that happens it leads to increased il6 uh, tnf alpha tissue factor etc all these mediators that cause endothelial dysfunction and it causes reduced no which causes some weird kind of vasodilation etc and finally any kind of hyperinflammatory state in the body will definitely cause atherosclerosis or any kind of states that affect the body hemostasis or platelet function might also cause atherosclerosis and increased risk of thrombus formation thrombus is basically accumulated platelets and now finally let's see the consequence of atherosclerosis and why it causes myocardial infarction or heart attack for this i'm going to use this robin's diagram as a reference because i feel it's very easy to understand so as you see the fatty streak this is a normal one a fatty streak is being formed by the accumulation of lipids due to hyperlipidemia etc and then you have the intimal thickening by fibroblast by smooth muscle cells macrophages everything and finally you have a proper plaque so what happens is whenever there's a thin cap which is thin smooth muscles and calcified extracellular matrix over the macrophages the plaque tends to rupture and usually ruptures cause hemorrhages etc and when this plaque ruptures you know the necrotic debris inside all of this leads to the formation of thrombus thrombus is basically when any kind of substance is found in the blood stream platelets surround that structure and form a mass and this thrombus can go get stuck in any of the coronary arteries coronary arteries are the arteries that supply the heart musculature if there's a thicker cap there might be erosion or ulceration of the cap which again leads to thrombus formation which accumulates in the coronary arteries and in case some kinds of vessels are involved in the atheroma this kind of rupture might also lead to blood coming out and occlusion or obstruction of the entire lumen of the artery and this artery might be the coronary artery too and finally you know all the lipid debris inside form emboli emboli are again any substance that causes an obstruction of a vessel and all of these together in case they obstruct the coronary artery the heart's muscles do not receive any kind of blood supply when there is no blood supply to the heart's muscle it obviously dies and stops functioning when heart's muscle dies and stops functioning it leads to extreme pain cardiac dysfunction and ultimately 
myocardial infarction or heart attack and this my guys is atherosclerosis i really wanted to make a teaching video but i really wasn't able to think of good topics because i hadn't revised anything that well so what i did on a sunday was sit down revise a topic and make a video on it and i hope you liked it and if you do like it if you want to know about myocardial infarction or anything related to pathology any pathology topic that you want me to explain that i want to explain etc i'd love to do a video about it because i realized that pharmac and microbio aren't really topics that i can teach but patho yes definitely i can so if you do so if you do like this video if you have any suggestions if you have any corrections in the video please put it down in the comment section thank you bye